Good morning, the church. How are you this morning? Welcome to the Enterprise Community Church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is. It is a day of rejoicing. Now, like I've said before, every day is a day of rejoicing. The good Lord only makes good days. It's a matter of whether we're willing to focus on the good part that He gives us or the challenges that He gives us to help us grow. So, this morning we have just a few announcements, but the one I want to really point out is that a special thanks from Enterprise Rocks for the participation last Sunday. It was, it was pretty amazing. We had 97 kids that actually uh, signed up over there at the park for the prize. We had a little girl named, four-year-old little girl named Kimberly, who won the grand prize, which we got her a scooter, and a soccer ball, and a basketball, and a soccer net, and she was pretty excited when we delivered that to her here yesterday. Uh, but we want to thank you all for, for your participation and your help that you, you provided in, in making that day happen. I'll tell you what, I was over at the scout house when, they, when the fire department turned on the water on that truck. It was amazing. I wish I had had a camera right then at that moment because there was kids running from everywhere. It was, it was a pretty amazing thing to see. Uh, we do, this coming week, we have men's breakfast on Wednesday, I mean on Saturday. As far as we know, we're still having it, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, but that's all there is for this coming week. So uh, I don't have any birthdays this coming week. I don't have any anniversaries. The week after we get to see a few, but not this coming week. So is there any other announcements or are there any other announcements that you would like to bring forth? Uh, case. In that case, would you bow your heads for an opening prayer? Oh Lord our God, you are worthy of all our praise. You are the God who never fails to keep his promises. We thank you that in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we see your love, your justice, and your mercy, your provision, and your victory. You are the God who lifts up those who are weighed down. You are the God who provides for your children. Our desire is to praise you as long as we live. Inhabit our praises as we gather together today. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray it. Amen. Psalm 95.1 says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. He will stand and join as, as you're able in singing. Uh, he has made me glad. And you have faith to sing. Number 2270. I apologize. I forgot to grab your Number 
Please join me in the call to worship. God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears will be attending to the prayers offered in this place. Loving God, we claim your promises to us today. Heal our land, heal us, help us to seek your face in worship today. Amen. Jesus, though we were through, excuse me, Jesus, though you were the very nature of God, you did not consider equality with God as something to be used to your own advantage. Rather, you humble yourself, you make yourself nothing. Lord, you are the ultimate example for us, but we ignore it. We seek our own best interest and puff ourselves up with pride. Please, please humble us as we confess our sins to you now. Holy God, we come before you in humility, for we do not live as we ought. We do not love you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We do not love our neighbor as ourselves. We are sinners in need of rescue and transformation. So we pray in all humility that you will change our hearts and minds, that you will show us again how to love others the way you love us. That you will grant us the grace to experience your Spirit's guidance and love. That you will put power and courage in our hearts to do your will. This we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. The blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In that case, 
Would you like a bag of heads in for a word of prayer? Adonai, we thank you for the refreshing rain, for fields are ripened according to your timetable. We are ever amazed at the incredent workings of this world that you created. The beauty of a sunrise or a rose that shows up unexpectedly on a bush. We are thankful that it is all dependent on your authority and power and not dependent on us. God, in Micah 6 8, you tell us to walk humbly with your God. Today, we choose to walk humbly with you. We choose to live by your Holy Spirit and to follow your lead. Help us to hear you clearly, for we do not want to walk by pride or self-sufficiency. We want to walk with you. Today we also ask for your help to walk humbly with our brothers and our sisters. It is all too easy for us to fall prey to our flesh and walk in arrogance, but pride causes division, and Lord, we desire peace. Help us to humble ourselves in order that we do not let lies of the enemy overtake us. Rather, help us to count ourselves as equals with one another. Help us to value one another in this humble spirit so that we may live to the fullest. Lord, at this time, we lift up our prayers of intercession for our neighbors who are struggling with illness and with pain. For them we ask, you. Those who are angry and emotionally hurt, grant them your peace. Those who have been hurt by those they trusted, comfort them. Those who have done the hurting, we pray for those as well. And we pray for those who attended the Back to School Bash 2. May it bring them closer to you. And for our nation, Lord, we pray, bring revival and let it begin with us. As we have offered names silently and situations to you in prayer for your compassionate healing and love, we had our own names as well. Heal our wounds, we pray. Enable us to be strong in our commitment to you. Keep us open always to your abiding love. Lord, these prayers we offer up in the precious name of Jesus, who was and is and ever will be the only Savior, and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The praise hymn this morning is Jesus Loves Me, hymn number 191 in your red hymnals. And you may remain seated in the same.
upstairs with the big folks at church, you know? It's time now for our offering. We're going to offer up a prayer for the offering in the back, and then we're going to do noisy change. And the, the two kids here are going to do it when the time comes. So get ready. Yeah, you're looking around. You don't know who I'm going to fall and hold on this deal, do you? Please bow for a word of prayer. May the offering we make this day mark our commitment to keeping our eyes and our hearts set on a closer walk with you, Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. And it is noisy. Change Sunday. So Gene and I are going to pass that around to get your monies out. Make it worth our time to wander around here, all right? Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the giving, the giving that goes into the missions fund here and for the work that it does next door for the elementary kids. We ask that you would be in those kids' lives and that they would feel the love that you have for them as well as that we have for them. For it's in your son's name we pray on the end. All right. I don't know whether that was on before or not. Is my microphone working? Can you hear me? Okay. I can't tell, so I guess I'm good. All right. Oh, you're right. And you know what? I'm going to make her say it, but she actually gave me a heads up, so I know what it's going to be. What is it, Aaron? 703. 703. Swing low, sweet chariot. Swing low, sweet, sweet chariot.
never been connected. Makes me want to go listen to Gator Vocal Band, though. They, they, they get really wild and crazy in their harmonies on that particular song. Uh, probably crazier than I do, but it's sure fun to hear them when they get to do it. Again. Sermon this morning is titled, And the Greatest Is. And I like that picture. Gene found that for there. And I thought that, that's about as appropriate as you can get to. It's based upon Matthew 18, 1 through 7, and then verse 10. So, reading from English Standard Version, at the, that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, Unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come. But woe to the one by whom the temptations come. See, that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Lord, as I give this message this morning, may it be something that you would have each individual person here know and hear and let them take it to heart to be the message you want them to hear. For it is in your son's name I pray. Amen. The story is told of two ducks and a frog who lived happily together in a farm pond. Well, I know we've got ponds, we've got the frogs at our place, we haven't had any ducks, but we do have frogs. They, but these guys were the best of friends. The three of them would amuse themselves and play together in that little water hole. But when the hot summer days came, the pond began to dry up. Soon it became very evident that they would have to move. This was no problem for the ducks. They could easily just fly off to another pond. But the frog was kind of stuck. So they decided amongst them, that they would pick us up a stick and put it in the bill of each of the ducks. And the, the frog would hang on with his mouth as they flew to another pond. Well, that plan really worked well. It was working well. So well, in fact, that while they were flying along, a farmer looked up in admiration and mused, Well, isn't that a clever idea? I wonder who thought of that. The frog said, I did! Didn't go so well. That joke didn't either. I'll have to mark that down. It didn't go for something else. But isn't that a great picture of the pride goeth before the fall? Well, don't you think so? When it came time for a personal bit of glory, he forgot all about why he was even holding on to that stick in the first place. It's also a picture of where the twelve disciples were spiritually at that time. They heard the word kingdom and their minds went off on a tangent as they forgot all that Jesus had done just taught them about self-sacrifice and about taking up your cross and following him. Suddenly they were back into that competitive mode and that competitive mindset wanting to know who the officers were and what their positions were going to be in this new kingdom. It was like they suddenly forgot the entire Sermon on the Mount that he taught, where he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit and those who mourn. Blessed are the meek and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, and those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Does any of that sound anything like, hey Jesus, which one of us is the greatest in your kingdom? Doesn't sound like it to me. In the Hobbit movies, which are based on a 
book by the same name written by J.R.R. Tolkien. They gave a name for that change that comes over people when they get self-centered and start lusting after power and riches and fame. They call it gold fever. C.S. Lewis also addressed that same self-centered greed in the voyage of the Dawn Treader from the Chronicles of Narnia, where uh, a self-centered and vindictive Eustace becomes a dragon after lusting after a dragon's gold and all the getting even he can do with that gold. It's the old problem of being distracted by the things of this world. One word, kingdom, and off with the twelve disciples down the wrong road. I think Jesus probably gave a huge sigh deep down inside him thinking, will they never learn? Well, they never understand what I'm trying to say. But he didn't belittle any of them or berate them. However, he did not talk about the importance of any particular individual in the kingdom. What he did, though, was tell the disciples that they must change their attitude. He then used a surprisingly clear visual aid to explain to them again what this meant. A child. As I've mentioned before in previous messages, widows and children had no legal status or protections under the law at that time. They also had negligible social status. This was particularly true for children. Folks, that was not just the Jewish tradition that had that problem either. It was also the case with the whole Greco-Roman world. In many cases, this led to a negative attitude toward children to the point that it was even socially acceptable for them to be kicked out and abandoned to fend for themselves on the streets if the parents didn't feel like dealing with them or being responsible for them. That's where the term alumnus comes from. The alumni were the dumped out and abandoned children of the influential families in Rome. Unless we get, just to keep us from getting too, oh, I can't believe they were like that. We have the same issue here in our country. Sadly, it was the same in our nation back in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. That's what the orphan trains were all about, which we've talked about before. It was so that they could deal with all those abandoned children in our own cities back east. That lack of legal status for children, by the way, is what has, up, has us in the latter 20th century and up to the present able to justify killing prenatal children for no reason, no reason at all, except they just inconvenient. But for most families and most kids, then just now, Children were protected and cared for by their parents, who, by the way, loved them. The point of our text, though, isn't about the parents and the guardians at the time, but rather about from the perspective of the child. It's about the attitude of the child. If we accept that children at that time had no legal status, but were totally dependent on their families, and specifically on their parents, and we are to be like them, how does that personal attitude play out in our relationship with God as our Father in heaven? There was another place where Jesus suggested the need for us to be like children. Reading from John 3, verses 3, 5, and 7 through 7, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot enter or see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The plain and simple meaning of this text is that we are to have a spiritual encounter with God 
as we accept Jesus as our Savior. And we receive new life, a rebirth, which is called being born again. But there is something else that we can see also in this example. Here again, we see a change in priorities and a comparison that brings to mind a child. As we are born again, we are, in essence, or in a sense, to be like a small child. We start over. We are totally dependent on our parent, which is God in our rebirth, but it is a spiritual birth rather than a physical birth. In our hearts, we are to be are to give up our pride and to give up our independence. In our hearts, we are to give up our social position. Our focus on these things is the same as focusing on the world and the world's values, which, by the way, are contrary to focusing on God. Did you notice in today's scripture that Jesus didn't lift up the innocence of a child as a thing that we're to emulate? He didn't suggest that we be pure as a child. He didn't command us to have faith of a child. No, he said, whoever humbles himself like, like this child. Humility and the lack of concern for social positioning is what lifted, he lifted up as the determiner of our position in God's heavenly kingdom. A child, you see, knew that he or she had no rights. A child knew that he or she was totally dependent on the good graces of his parent for everything from a place to sleep to the very food he or she ate. A child knew that he had no social position, so there was no need to struggle to attain one. A child didn't have to think about these things. It was simply their life. It was simply the way things were. That is what Jesus was lifting up as an example of greatness in the kingdom of heaven. Frankly, Jesus is our best example of how an adult can still be childlike in the sense that he is talking about here. Jesus demonstrated the humbleness of a child when, as Paul put it, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He was not forced to do so. He humbled himself. Notice the same phrase is used here in our text today when Jesus tells us whoever humbles himself. The issue isn't compulsion, but a willingness to acknowledge in ourselves that in our new position. We know we have no rights. We know we are totally dependent on the good graces of God for everything from a place to sleep to the very food we eat. We know that we have equal positions before God, so there's no reason to struggle to obtain that position. We don't have to think about these things. They just are. That is part of what being humble before God is about. Now, because that description of a child is supposed to represent us as members of God's kingdom, the king has a few things to say about those who would mislead his children in the kingdom. So verses 6 and 7, Jesus says, Whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. Although Jesus is still talking to us as children of the kingdom of heaven, starting in verse 5, he's basically letting us know how just how important it is to him that we be assured and be humble. And also that he will deal with those who would lead us into sin and cause us to sin. How serious is it to cause someone to sin? In a spiritual sense, it is a capital offense to do so. Just for an information, never is drowning a form of punishment in any Jewish text anywhere, in any of the writings at all. 
They were downright superstitious about the idea of drowning. It's part of why they feared the ocean, as they talked about the depths of the ocean. But according to William Barclay, the very picture of drowning had its terror for the Jew. Drowning was sometimes a Roman punishment, but never Jewish. The point is that throughout Matthew's Gospel, Jesus places a special burden on those who would be leaders in the community that we call the church. Woe to those who, instead of embracing the little ones, which is the Christians, causes them to stumble or lose their faith. This is a serious caution, one that is capital offense, against teaching that what God says is sin is okay, or that it isn't sin at all. It is a serious caution about causing people to doubt God and the Bible through false teaching about the Bible. This is one of the concerns with the direction of the organized church and where it is going in the Western world, particularly right here in the U.S. As it redefines the terms, redefines sin, and creates some kind of a neo-Christian ideology all of its own and new. It's a grave situation that our world is in. By the way, according to Google, a neo-Christian is any interpretation of Christianity based on the prevalent philosophy of a given period. And what that basically means is the Western churches are allowing the culture to transform it instead of the churches transforming the world, which is our mission. <clears throat> and then when we get to verse 10, Jesus speaks again of the little ones. By that phrase, he's referring especially to the young children, like the one he has before them, right there at that time. Though, but he can also be for those little ones who could uh, have become like children in their faith, which is us, all of us, our little children, that that could apply to. And Jesus reinforces to us that each one of us, little ones, was valuable to him. I want to end today with a quote from Abraham Lincoln that makes me wonder if we in America will ever stop repeating the mistakes and errors of the past. And it's from his proclamation of the Day of Humiliation Fasting in 1983. 1883, I'm sorry. We have been recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pay to the God, pray to the God who made us. Lincoln's address would apply just as much today as it did to the nation in 1863. Folks, we need to nurture humility in ourselves as we turn our lives over to God and get a true perspective of who we are in relation to Him. And we need to humbly repent of our sins and humbly pray to God for the healing of our land. Please join me in a closing prayer. Holy God, your servants argued about who would be the greatest in your kingdom. Help us to be confident in the love you have for us so that we feel no need to compete for your attention. Help us to truly understand that the greatest is like a child. And to be your children and totally dependent on you as our Heavenly Father is who we are. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior 
and our Lord. Amen. And now if you would stand and join in singing our closing hymn, Abide With Me, hymn number 700 in your red hymns.